Welcome to this webinar 3C003, a support webinar for centres and students. The webinar is one of a series of recorded webinars for each of the units within the Foundation Certificate in People Practice. So the webinar is aimed at those who are working towards the CIPD Foundation Qualification or those who are supporting those working towards the qualification. The full title of the unit is 3CO03 Core Behaviours for People Professionals and it is the third core unit in the Foundation Certificate. So let's just take a moment to remind ourselves of what this unit is about. Unit 3CO03 actually focuses on the essential, general, required behaviours we would expect from a people professional working at this level. Specifically, it looks at aspects of behaviour such as ethical principles and how these affect the way we behave, our professional values and how these affect our practice at work, our professional development and how we approach our CPD. The Learner Assessment Brief that we are concerned with here has been written specifically to enable students to achieve all the assessment criteria within this unit 3C003. As assessment briefs are updated regularly, it should be noted that this particular brief is the one issued in June 2024 and therefore has the assessment ID, as you can see there, CIPD 3C003-2401 meaning it's the first assessment brief issued in 2024. As you can also see at the bottom of that page, and this image is the front page of the assessment brief you should be working with, you can see there again that the brief was issued in June 2024, and that that means that this will expire in June 2025. And importantly for both centres and students, the very last moderation window for assignments done for this brief is September 2025. So what's inside this assessment brief? Well all the assessment briefs are made up of a number of tasks. In this case there is just one single assessment task and that task is broken down into five questions or instructions with an approximate total word count of 2,000 words. So you have 2,000 words to complete the responses to those five questions or instructions, i.e. the whole task must be completed within 2,000 words. So what is the task? Well, it's quite straightforward. You are asked to draft material for a code of ethical and professional practice. The assessment brief presents a scenario. This is helpful if you're not already working in a people practice team as it positions you in a people practice team where you can think about your responses to the questions. So in this scenario, assume you work in a PP team in a medium sized organisation and that your people practice director wants to introduce a code of ethical and professional practice for the team. Your director wants everyone to contribute and for your part you've been asked to explain your thoughts in relation to five specific key aspects of ethical and professional practice. And those five aspects of practice are stated for you. So we have values and how they impact behaviour, conforming with legislation, working inclusively, being inquisitive about the world of work, and being proactive in continued professional development, being proactive in your CPD. So these are five areas you're asked to write about, but rather than writing generally, the assessment brief has been condensed into five questions. So there's one question for each of these five aspects of practice. So essentially all you have to do to achieve this unit is correctly and comprehensively answer the five questions. So what are these five questions? Question one concerns itself with ethical principles and professional values 
and in both cases how these can inform the way people behave at work. So just a note before you start on question one, not to get too hung up about the difference between ethical principles and professional values. This is often a concern for students tackling this unit, but essentially there is very little difference between the two. Professional values, like most values, emanate from ethical principles, so they will be the same or very similar. If there is a difference, it is that ethical principles are very general, essential life values and principles. Ethical principles apply to everyone. They are how, how their behaviour is informed by what they believe. So ethical principles applies to the wider aspect of life, how we, how we behave in life generally. Whereas professional values in this context relates more to how we behave at work. So what are our professional values? Determines how we approach our work and how we behave in the workplace. So as mentioned, they're going to be very similar, but think about one as a general value and one as very much a workplace related value. So let's now have a look at that question. So question one, if we take the first part, says please explain ethical principles and how these can inform the way people behave at work. So take that question literally and respond clearly. You should begin by explaining ethical principles. What do you understand these to mean? You might want to refer to some of the theory on ethical principles. What do they mean to you? Explain ethical principles. You may want to give examples of these. And then extend your response to make sure you cover the second part of this question. So for one or two ethical principles, you need to explain how these might inform work. So there's an example there. So for example, if someone has the ethical principle equality and fairness, how would that show up in their work? Well, they may have a concern for equal rights and opportunities for all. They may stand up against any unfairness. Can you think of a specific example to illustrate that? Perhaps they ensure that their delivery of a service or an allocation of a resource is done very fairly. Again, can you think of an example to illustrate that? Or maybe they support everyone having access to a particular opportunity. So a people practice person in their work how would they demonstrate, how would it show up that they have the ethical value of equality and fairness? So there's some hints there, but try and come up with examples um, from your own thinking. Question one isn't complete until you've done the second part about professional values. So professional values and how these can inform the way people behave at work. So again, begin by explaining and maybe giving examples of professional values. What do professional values mean to you? What examples could you give? And for one or two of those values, explain how these might inform work. So again, there's an example there. It may be that a people practitioner's professional value is about professionalism and accountability. And in that case, it may be that they want to work to the best of their ability, maintain their competence, keep sharpening the saw. They may honour their commitments. They may feel strongly about honouring their commitments. They might be keen to meet deadlines despite challenges. They might take responsibility for a particular piece of work or a mistake they've made. So think about how this value of professionalism will show up in the work of a people practice practitioner. And maybe you can give some specific examples. Maybe some of those hints there will give you um, give you a bit of a clue to taking to come up with some examples that will help you respond to this question. So for question one, you're looking at ethical values and professional values, and in each case, how they might inform the way a people practitioner behaves at work. Moving on to question two. Question two asks you, remember you as a member of the People Practitioner Team, to give three examples of how you conform with the Equalities Act, or updates of the Act, or alternatively regulation in your own country. So think about that. A people practice person, how might they conform with those acts? Perhaps they deliver a service or a product such as recruitment, payroll, training that might be governed, well, that is governed by equalities law. 
how, in what way, would their work conform with the Equalities Law? They may even work in an area that particularly relates to a protected characteristic. They may have an involvement with disability, maternity, etc, etc. Again, think about and give an example of the way someone in a people practice team would conform with Equalities Law. It may also be just in the way they do their work that they demonstrate non-discriminatory behaviour. So you may be able to think of an example like that, rather than it being their specific work, the way they actually are with their colleagues, their clients, etc, etc. So position yourself in the people practice team and consider how in that role you would be conforming with equalities law, whether in the UK or any other nation. Moving on to question three, we're now being asked to summarise different ways people practitioners can demonstrate respectful and inclusive working in relation to three areas. So you can see the three areas there. We've got contributing views and opinions, clarifying problems and working as part of a team. So the best way to approach this question is to take each of these separately. So let's do that. So the first one, we're given the context, which is to contribute your views and opinions. And we have to think about what respectful and inclusive working would be in that context. So again, what would respectful working be when contributing views and opinions? Maybe it's about being honest, but tactful. That would be respectful behaviour. Maybe inclusive behaviour is recognising that others may have different perspectives. A couple of examples there, but what does it mean to you? How would you summarise respectful and inclusive working in the context of contributing views and opinions? So you need to think about that and come up with your own summary. And the same applies here. You've been asked to consider the context of clarifying problems and issues and to think of that context in terms of what respectful and inclusive working would be. So respectful working, is that about staying calm, being non-defensive, non-aggressive? What else would respectful working be, mean? What about being inclusive in this context? Maybe it's about giving everyone a voice, but what else would inclusive behaviour be? Again, think about those two types of behaviour, types of working, respectful and inclusive, positioned within the context of clarifying problems and issues, and think about what would that mean to you and come up with your own summary. And finally, same thing again, but now in the context of working effectively as part of a team, what would respectful and inclusive working mean in this context? So maybe it's about respecting everyone's contribution to the team. Maybe it's about ensuring no one's left out. But it's also about lots of other things. And you need to come up with your summary of what that would mean. Question four, changes tack. We're now being asked to think about three ways that a people practice team member can find out about current issues and developments in work and people practice. So as someone who is studying for a qualification or working with qualifications, you are no doubt very active in finding out about these things. So you need to come up with your three recommendations for this. And it might be a YouTube channel, it might be a magazine, a newsletter, a website, etc etc but you need to be specific here it's not enough to recommend podcasts you need to recommend a particular podcast that you are aware of that you know about and recommend it and explain why you're recommending it what's the benefit of someone accessing that podcast so three recommendations for how people practice team members can find out about current issues and developments in the world of work and people practice. Moving on to question five. Question five is a little bit different to the previous four in that it does have a, a direct explanation aspect to the question, but there's also a second part. But don't miss this first part. You must begin by explaining how People practitioners can be proactive and effective in CPD. So what is a, an effective, proactive approach to CPD? You need to think about that and explain it. What does it involve? 
what does being effective at CPD mean? So you be, need to begin by explaining that. But then you need to support your answer by showing that you walk the talk yourself. And, that, and you do that by adding your own CPD record. Now that CPD record can take whichever format you like. It might be a traditional structured CPD record, often tabular, or it might be pages from my CPD Reflections tool. It doesn't really matter what format you use, but what does matter is that you meet these two bullet points here. So your CPD record must include at least three development activities undertaken within the last two years. And for each of those development activities, you must have your reflections on what you learned and how that learning has impacted your practice and behaviour. So two parts to that question. Make sure you do them both. Don't get so um, concerned about getting your CPD record attached that you forget the first bit about explaining. It's really important that you cover all aspects of that question. When you're thinking about your CPD record and what development activities to include, give yourself something fairly substantial, something that gives you something to talk about. It doesn't matter what sort of development activity it is, formal, informal, work-based, um, a course, it doesn't matter. It might be in response to a performance issue you had to undertake the development, or it might just be that it was something you were interested in. It doesn't matter. What's more important is that we want to show that you understand the impact development activity of any kind has had on your performance and that you understand the reason for undertaking these activities. So learning and impact also must be included in there. This is the important part. What did you get from that development activity? Some examples there. Did you gain a greater understanding? How is your performance different? Was the activity worth doing? Did the activity make you more aware of other development needs you might have? Overall, what conclusions did you draw from the activity? And what conclusions for further activities? What have you learned from that development activity? And how has it changed you? Once you've completed question five, you will have got to the end of this assignment, just those five questions to complete. And you should, at the end of it, ensure that you have two items of evidence. First of all, you must have your written response to questions one to five. Remember, question five needs a written response. And within those five questions, you should have 2,000 words, plus or minus 10% usually, but approximately 2,000 words to cover those whole five questions. That doesn't have to be evenly apportioned across the five. Use them as you think best. Also, in terms of evidence, you must have your CPD record, which must meet those requirements we've just discussed at question five. And one good thing here is that your CPD record is not included in that word count. So you can make your CPD record as involved as you like. It does not have to be, it's definitely not included in the 2,000 words. And remember, you can present that CPD record however you like, as long as it's agreed with your centre, it's a recognised format, and that it meets those requirements stated at question five. Just a little bit of guidance before we conclude this webinar. We've mentioned as we've gone through that it's really important that you do respond clearly to the questions. Students sometimes waste a lot of words giving us irre irrelevant information that doesn't help their case at all. So use your words wisely. Read the question and respond clearly and directly to the question. Include any examples or references that you think will be helpful that will enhance your response. But remember those, that word count. And also be careful when presenting your responses that they are clearly linked to the question. So we know exactly what question you're asking, you're answering. And you can do that through the, like those examples there. So you can actually write up the question and then give your answer. Always making sure you include the assessment criteria reference, AC 1.1, etc. But if writing out the whole question is taking up too many words, you might want to just give a redacted heading um, as here. 
that's redacted from the sentence above. Keep it as short as you like if you're worried about word count. As long as you've got the AC reference, you're okay. But it does always look better and read better if you have, however small, some kind of subheading to your response. Finally, and this is essential, make sure you comply with the evidence requirements that we've just discussed and make sure you comply with the word count requirements. When you've taken all that on board, your assignment should be complete, but just a few final checks. Always make sure that your name and student number has been added, that you've proofread your assignment, that you've made sure you've got a clear layout with those subheadings and AC references. Make sure you've met the word count properly, check your word count, and above all, submit your assignment on time. So when you've completed all of that, you will have got to the end of your assignment. You will also have reached the end of this webinar. So thank you for staying with us and we hope it has been helpful to you in completing your assignment. Please note that there are other recorded webinars available for the other units. Finally, good luck with your assignment. Thank you.